nutrition sweater. That's pretty fancy. I was so t- just chilly? chilly. I know. I don't like that. That's why you got to get those 32 degree long sleeves uh, undershirts from uh, you know who. <laughs> Oh. The cost of the car. All right, turn this TV off. You just, you can't do it. Yeah, it's just when you have severe ADD? attention problems, like I do, it's just visual stimulation Ooh, just too much. freaks me out. Too much. So I saw a uh, Hello Kitty backpack I almost grabbed, but is Cora, is, she's not super kitty, is she? I think it's coming. I've been, I, I've made sure to keep the Hello Kitty uh, toaster that you gave us. Good. It's at the office right now. People at the office didn't quite appreciate the ingenuity. But it's still kitties? Oh, yeah. It makes a perfect toast kitty. Yeah. You toast it, and it comes out with a little Hello Kitty. It, and it really works best with uh, white bread. Well, sure. As you can imagine. Yeah. It's a blank, pal- a blank canvas. Yeah. That's the wonder of white bread. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. You're going to ratchet it up, A-game, for the... Um, for the podcast, for the Wait, holiday I, I podcast, only, I don't. Wh- I got, I got one speed. Yeah, I got one letter in that alphabet. A, a, <laughs> Omicron. Becky. Like, I am Groot, but I am a game. Yeah, I can see that. Everything's Groot. <laughs> Everything's Grooty. Um, we will now drop it in to the slot that is a hotline Christmas special featuring hotline Christmas special. Yeah. Uh, Kurt Huffman in a cowl neck sweater is that what it's called i think so it's got that little button it's very like collegiate professor huh i think okay okay i like that but the cowl i think is like a bigger sweater i mean more more um like uh what's his name in uh the big lebowski oh right yeah yeah well uh i feel like some mornings when even my neck is cold Mm mm-hmm that's when I have to do either the turtleneck sweater, like I did yesterday yep. in Seattle, or this one, just to, it's like an extra level of chilliness. Yeah, I I don't think a turtleneck is a good look for me, but um, I mean, I could be convinced otherwise. I think I'm just a little too stocky. I think you need to be pretty long to pull oh, off like a me? turtleneck. Long like you, <laughs> long like you. Well, no, I imagine, I think it probably, you can rock it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, having the uh, traps. Um, That's a problem. Doesn't help. I just went to Wink's Hardware, oh, which I love. Great Portland institution. Uh, the reason I did that is because I had to get some replacement screws for the door of the shower that I used to shower in when I was a little kid and do still shower in on occasion at my mom's house. Oh. This door, when I took it off the hinges, I was shocked by how small it is it's maybe a 16 18 inches wide Mm, and the box that the shower is in can't be bigger than 36 by 36 so when you go in you just go in sideways pretty much you like crab walk in i don't know there's something about (laughs) that shower i think it might be the tightness of it Uh, i imagine there's some nostalgia i'm sure plenty has been spilled in that shower um, but it is, it's shockingly small. And so the other day after I finished working at the commissary where I had literally ground 400 pounds of meat and was covered with a thin sheen of pork and lamb fat, I, I had a meeting, uh, at which I wanted to both look and smell professional. And so I zipped by friends my mom's house and jumped into my old shower right sideways and i was in a hurry so it's just a quick wash and go right and when i stepped out of the shower i slipped on the floor and i either grabbed the door of the shower or i hit it with my knee or elbow and it cracked oh and then i fell on my ass in the shower Ooh, back inside the shower yeah oh yeah and um, I didn't realize in my haste, because I was late for my meeting, that the door had shattered a little bit. And some of those glass shards had actually gone back into the shower. And then when I fell, they went on me. Into and, you. Into and onto me. So I had, I didn't really pick on up on this until I was drying off and right. I could feel sort of scratchiness. And I mean, my mom's towels are not new. So sometimes I think maybe they're just kind of knobby, but this was like 
lacerating rather than abrasive. And uh, so at that point, I looked in the mirror and saw that uh, that my bottom was, in fact, a crime scene, shredded and, and bleeding. Oh, but again, delightful. I was late. So I pulled up my underpants, uh, got dressed, I ran up to the kitchen where my mom was entertaining her friend Mo. And uh, I think I shocked Mo by dropping trowel and saying, Mom, does this look all right? She's like, Jesus Christ, what happened? I gave her the quick version, and she said, oh, I, I think you'll be okay Put Mupiracin on it. So I left for my meeting, and I'm sitting in the seat of the car, and I'm just in agony, like I'm on fire, and I'm thinking I'm just scratched up. And then when I got to my meeting, which was at a weed processing facility, I was still kind of just, it was like I had ants in my pants. And so I'm, I'm walking up to the door and I'm reaching my hands into my oh, underwear and kind of shaking them out and standing in front of the door, forgetting, of course, that at all of these facilities, uh, security is paramount. And so there are cameras everywhere. So the door opens and I've got both of my hands inside of my underwear. And there's my host saying, is everything all right? Uh, and it was, I suppose we had the meeting. Um, I could feel that I was still bleeding. And I think what I had done was in drying off, I had spread the shards around my body. Oh, nice. And then when I pulled up my shorts, I think I collected a little uh, oh, extra. kind of concentration of glass shards, nice. which continued to work on me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got rid of those underpants, which were pollocked with blood. Mm. And uh, everything's okay. I took the door off. I tried to get the door fixed today the glass place was open winks of course delivered with the screws but i could not help but be reminded of some of the other stories oh uh, yes that uh, that yes. shower now i see where we're going here that okay. that shower got tell. it got it and in the spirit of giving i thought we would give our listeners a snapshot of of our young lives <laughs> and the way i remember it is we were going to have a barbecue right at my house yeah that's right i think that you um this is in high school, so I think you had been taking classes. Is that there? Is that right? Had already been taking some culinary. You had some culinary thing. It was during. It was the year before our senior year of high school. Okay. So that would have been the summer of 1987. Good God. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I was. I mean, other than my interest via my dad, who was quite yep. a good cook, I don't know that I had any culinary aspirations at that point. Uh, further than um, pyrotechnic. Right. We had aspirations of lighting things on fire. We did that a lot. Yep. Yeah, and so um, you had me get all the kindling because we were going to first create some kindling for the coals to kind of light them uh, that way, and you procured uh, um, a can of something which uh, you told me to spray on the wood. Well, it was um, carburetor I'm not even fluid. Carburetor fluid, right? Aerosol yeah. carburetor fluid, uh, which I believe is pretty flammable. Yeah, I think it's designed to jumpstart uh, engines uh, when they are kind of gummed up. So, uh, and it jumpstarts them by creating a massive explosion oh. uh, in the engine. Yes. So I did. I sprayed on the uh, wood, and uh, then you gave me matches and told me to light it uh -huh. and when i lit it uh i caught on fire because there was a massive explosion uh there was a huge fire and then because it was an aerosol there was a huge amount of ambient uh flammable uh material aerosol. right yeah, yeah and so, so was, it was like a, you you're, you were enveloped in a cloud of flame flame yes okay all right and mm -hmm. then uh i thought my hair was on fire uh, and so I sprint downstairs into said uh, into the tiny shower. into the tiny shower and jumped in, convinced that I was on fire. Right. Uh, ripped off my shirt, jumped in, uh, and then when I got out of the shower, um, I looked in the mirror and uh, the skin from my nose, uh, all of it was uh, hanging from the front of my nose uh, over my mouth. Yeah, see, now, and for me, that was a real turning point because before that, <laughs> I recall, I had gone into the shower 
not the shower, but the room. And I was sitting there on the toilet entreating you not to tell my parents what we had done. Right. And I was pretty sure we were safe. Yeah. And then you got out of the shower. Yeah. Um, And your nose was different. Yeah. Yeah. So the skin all came off and then I had third degree burns on my, so my eyelashes and eyebrows, of course, were gone. Oh, Jesus. Uh, I kind of lost probably about an inch to an inch and a half of all of my hair. So it was kind of, I had an interesting. Like a trim. Yeah. It was like a trim Mm -hmm. by fire. Yeah. Uh, So it was an interesting kind of, imagine quite curly hair shrunken by flame. Oh my Lord. Uh, So there's kind of a shrink wrap effect on my head. That was horrible. Uh, And then. The hand that held the match, my left, no, my right hand, uh, was very severely burnt all the way up my arm. Uh, and uh, and then I left uh, the house uh, so that nobody would discover it and started driving away, uh, only to discover after about an eighth of a mile that uh, my body was in shock. In shock, and it was screaming out in pain. Uh, and so I Turned stopped by around. a friend's house. Uh, oh, Seth Titchener's house. Oh God! That was right by Lewis and Clark, and just ran into his house screaming. And I went to the freezer uh, and started just filling up bags, Ziplocs of ice. Oof. And then I slowly, and then I applied them all over my face and my arms. And oh, then, I'm sorry about that. But he did get me to the emergency room quickly, and they uh, put some sort of silver uh, goop on me. I just know it was an incredibly expensive uh, topical treatment mm-hmm. and they put that everywhere uh, to kind of help and and today you know the only scar I have is right there that's the only thing on my hand my no scarring at all on my face oh uh, well uh, I mean I don't know if we call it scarring but no you know you look great yeah I mean you know I think it, it yeah, maybe have helped could have helped and uh, <laughs> so I uh, uh, and then I w- had my first experience with pain, pain medication. Ugh. And survey says, did uh, you like it? well, it, it did uh, make it tolerable. And uh, fortunately, uh, it just kind of made me look funny. Yeah. Probably a week later was my sister's eighth grade graduation. So I got to kind of be <laughs> <laughs> the burn, you know, the, the burn guy there, the... and then I had Boys State Ooh. that summer, uh, and um, so I got to go to Boys State and look a little bit like all scabby, there. all scabby. Oh <laughs> God, that's we really uh, we were very lucky, yeah, um, in our youth not to lose more appendages. Um, oh yeah, eyeballs. We just were, we just, I don't know why we kept dodging those bullets, but uh, I'm not going to be that guy who said we didn't have car seats and we stayed out until it was dark, but we did. Uh, and we managed to um, to get into a lot of trouble. Yeah, and especially for, you know, really kind of being dorks. Yeah. Uh, we got in a lot of trouble. Well, I think part of that had to do with the fact that we had friends who were both creative and, and well-equipped uh, in terms of explosive material and um, just ideas for uh, <laughs> nefarious activities. Um, moving from nefarious to holiday activities. All right, but finish the story about the shower because what we found out much later. Oh, that's the best part of the story, and that's really the gift. That's the gift this. for everybody. That's the yeah. Christmas gift. <laughs> uh, my dad died, shit, uh, 19 years ago? 19 years ago. And I found out shortly after he died, unfortunately, that on that day when I was down in the bathroom begging you not to get me in trouble, my father was convinced that we were screwing in the shower. And I wish I'd have known that. Yeah. He took that secret to his grave. To his grave. Well. I'm so glad I didn't know that. Why? You think it would have made you like grab me less going forward? Uh, no, but it would have made me mortified any time I was around your father. Yeah, yeah. Already your dad didn't like me very much. So I don't know that that's... He just was kind of cranky. Uh, often a cranky he guy. He just was cranky, you know? He, he saw way too much of him in his underwear. I think we were up late quite a bit. Yeah, he was and, quite disapproving of our lateness. And he was an old codger by then, too, you know? Yeah. He was, what was he? By the time we were in high school, he was 65. And he, I think, was just hoping to, 
share a bucket of cookies with my mom and watch, uh, <laughs> you know, the McNeil Lair Hour. And here we were playing D and D and eating shitty and pizza, just eating everything in his pantry, pretty much. Yeah, that was unfair. Yeah, and and also, um, you know, sometimes taking, sometimes taking the booze. I can remember in the holiday theme that my folks kept a funny little bottle of like I think it was Kirschwasser, mm-hmm. or but it was something real proofy. It was something that was that was deliberately speaking of flammability deliberately meant to catch on fire right and it was what they used every year to pour on plum pudding yeah and then light it on fire but i realized that that um that that was alcohol and that it was also clear and that if you put water into the bottle in in the same volume that you removed it would look like there was the same amount of alcohol in Mm -hmm. there and that worked probably for two years (laughs) Until uh, it was mostly water, and I can remember vividly on Christmas my folks trying to light it and probably pouring about five ounces ultimately on this plum pudding. And I think at the very end it, it managed a little Puff. kind of light blue, but it, it didn't. It, and you were like, the yeah, jig that's was up. I'll be darned. No, and then I think my dad probably ran his finger through it, and the, you know, God damn it. Well, you fortunately were innocent. Oh, certainly, yeah. Yeah, so I'm probably it, one of your nefarious friends. Couldn't have been me. <laughs> couldn't have been me. And Mark, I was asking our chum if he had any good holiday stories. He said, well, there was the time when we were home for college and we all went out and then John Bachman stayed at your house and someone else drove your car home, Lev. And I'm thinking, I don't know that we want to tell this story. And he said, oh, no, you should. And so here we are. Someone else drove my car home, to my, it may have been veg, in fact, because I was in the front seat and I was in no um, in no position. You, you were to drive. tired. I was no, I was blotto. Oh, and and because of that, I was left in the front seat, and I I pissed in the front seat of uh, the Peugeot. Oh, now this was not unfortunately the Peugeot station wagon with vinyl seats. Oh, this was the Peugeot sedan with uh, kind of like bluey, almost like plushy velvet seats which were um, mm, absorbent Mm -hmm. so after I woke up you know disoriented in the car at probably four in the morning oh you were just left in the I was left in the car (laughs) to soil myself and what and and what happened to John he went into the house and went to bed and went to bed (laughs) yeah so I woke up in the middle of the night like, oh shit, you know, and then like go back to my bed, and then in the morning I'm still in bed, and my dad awakens to find John Bachman and I. Like, God damn it, John, get out of here! I'll take you home. And so he takes John home, and John rides, of course, because my dad is not a taxi driver. John rides in the front seat right. of the Peugeot, and why would he take his station wagon when the sedan is in the driveway? Right? It's right. just there. Take that car. So John hops into the front seat and pretty quickly figures out what's going on because his pants get wet. Okay. So instead of sitting there, he kind of pushes his feet onto the floor. Levitates. And pushes his back against the uh, the seat so he's sort of off the... Right. The, 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 the out, of, out of harm's way. Right. Uh, which really upset my dad. I can remember him... Recounting the fact my dad's like, you getting taller, Veg? What's cool? You okay over there? What's going on? And he just rode it out, back pushed into the chair. So similarly, uh, I also irritated your dad in a similar way because I stayed over at your house and there was something I wasn't supposed to tell your dad. And uh, we were leaving. You were taking me back to my house and your dad was coming down. And he pulled up car to car and kind of were talking through the windows. And he asked me a question about, like, you know, what did you guys do last night or something? And I didn't know what the answer was mm. because I wasn't sure what the truth was, the official truth was. So I quickly unpeeled a banana and started eating it. <laughs> What's that? I'm sorry. My mouth is full. <laughs> I can't answer your question because I'm eating for, a banana. And for years, he was like, goddamn Huffman, just eating a goddamn banana. Huh. And I was well, like, that's quick thinking, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
what a dumb, I just <laughs> didn't know what to do, and you weren't catching on. Well, I'm not surprised about that either. Yeah, just as I was so irritated, and that was the best idea. I mean, I, another idea would just be to like jump out of the car and run. Right. Thought about that. Uh, I can remember, oh, this is, no, we're not going to tell this story during the holiday <laughs> issue because it's, you know, it's no. Uh, I want you to know that I'm doing on the 24th this whole like seven fishes thing. Have yeah. you heard of that? Yes. Even our friend, uh, our bougie buddy up north knows what that's all about. All the rage. My mom texted me. Let me see where this is from. Pretty fun. Uh, something about that. Well, while you plumb your text messages, I'm going to tell you my menu. Are you ready? Yeah, I am. And I'm going to cross-reference it against what uh, the text I got. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So, because it's not all about all about fish, we're going to have to open some cheese and crackers and a little bit of tinned fish so you can make little goodies mm -hmm. and some coconut shrimp because we're not afraid. Oh, love um, it. And then... Uh, what's the last one here? The other app. Uh, oh, shoot. Anyway, I'll move on. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, we're going to do a halibut collar, a little ponzu, oh, and then yum. some uh, some raw salmon. Mm -hmm. Just lightly sashimi style. And then, the, um, and then we're going to have a crab bisque, which will be the signal to move into the dining room. Ooh. Uh, That's the signal. You yes. Like ching ching. Well, we'll have just see. We'll have like a little. Um, we'll just have a little kind of stand around appetizer. Oh fish. shit! I can't find it. I know. Now we're both looking at our phones God. and being distracted. So, uh, tinned fish, coconut shrimp, and a variety of cheeses and crackers to start. Charred halibut collar with ponzu, and then salmon sashimi. And then the uh, crab bisque. And then we're going to do like a um, kind of salt crusted whole fish. Mm -hmm. um, shrimp stuffed sole with like a glaçage, very kind of classic mm -hmm. French. Uh, and then like a niçoise salad again, because you need a little bit of vegetable relief. Uh, and some rice. Sounds great. That's seven fishes. Yeah. Although niçoise is pretty protein heavy for... Yeah, no, well, we'll go light on the salmon part of it, but try to push a few, a and few little part. veggies. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, heavy on the olives. <laughs> 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 and then um, a ham. Going to have a ham. God, yeah, there's just no escaping it. A spiral ham from the place we love. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that local uh, regional provisions. <laughs> Um, I am going after this to get my mom a larger refrigerator so that maybe we can get her on board on the Costco trip. But one of the things I'm realizing about my mom and, and myself uh, to a lesser extent is this compression of time wherein 20 years is really nothing. Right. And, you know, about a month and a half ago, my mom's like, yeah, the freezer doesn't work very well and the ice smells and the water doesn't come out of the door. And I'm like, well, mom, you know, maybe we could get a new fridge. Yeah. Oh, th this is br brand. I just got this fridge. And I actually remember, uh, shockingly, when she got the fridge, because it was right before uh, we went to Brazil. And uh, it was kind of an emergency. To I, get the I remember when they got it, too. So that was like hmm, 23 years ago. Right. So it's not a new fridge. Nope. Um, <laughs> and she's just freaking out and she wants to meet me after this to look at the fridge. And, and so I'm telling her, mom, these dimensions have changed. The fridge that you've had for 25 years, you've hated because it's too small. I want you to measure this and we might have to cut the bottom of some cupboard doors. And she's just not okay with that. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, if she's willing to do that, the fridge, I think, will make her happier. But there is this sort of push and pull between not being willing to change my my dad's vision in there at all. And it's just a kind of a, you know, a stuckedness. Yeah, this, I mean, it's not at all experience with my mom. She's so open to changing her house <laughs> oh man okay okay good to hear <laughs> of course it's like she's she's had a fridge forever 
And thank God dishwashers don't change in size. Somehow right. that 24 inch has been standard forever. Uh, so that goes in and out. But fridges are a big problem. Yeah. People, you know, as we've gotten bigger as a culture, we need bigger fridges. Bigger fridges. And uh, she has the same thing. It's a built-in thing. I think my dad did like in 75 or right. something. And it's just, it's had to fit in the same goddamn <laughs> rectangular box ever since. Is there since. a guy who comes with a big block of ice once a week and, puts <laughs> and just it shoves in. it in there? <laughs> it's like, ugh. But uh, eventually, just it was just going to require a full remodel. But yeah. she's of the same boat. You know, she's 70, whatever, now. Yeah. We're not mixing it like, up too no. much. No, we did uh, get her a new light fixture, or she got her own new light fixture in the dining room. Baby stepping. Yeah, that was big. And considering, oh, and she did add a couple split systems for mm -hmm. air conditioning. Mm -hmm. We're looking into that, too. Because it was quite hot in her house. Uh, and I used to set up, like, in-window AC every year for right. her. Um, yeah, my mom doesn't have the AC and, in fact, couldn't even be in her house during this heat wave yeah uh but i think she's looking into doing that right now and she's got all baseboards which is prohibitively expensive yes and inefficient and smelly well the biggest change for us uh in doing restaurants in the last five years has been to dramatically upgrade our air conditioning right because there's easily a month every year now where i think before we used to think of it as a few days a year where right. we'd be above 100 but people just and also people's, maybe just as more and more people have been moving here from places that uh, where air conditioning is more systematic, like mm -hmm. California, they're not okay with going to a restaurant where it's 80 degrees right. or 85. That's a, that's a deal killer. And so, But also, to compound the problem, people are putting in AC units that are insufficient for that month. And so I, I know, I, I hear all those calls in July and August, like boom, out, boom, yeah. compressor. Boom. Oh, yeah. Down. So now we just super upgrade. And now the next thing that we're going to be doing is making sure that we have uh, natural gas generators because we are expecting more and more power outages uh, with kind of more radical winter weather. Right. Um, so we just feel like now as we design restaurants, we're looking for a big old natural gas generator that sits outside mm -hmm. and basically kicks in when you lose all power. Yeah. And the number of days that we've lost to power outages is just remarkable. And that's yeah. like, that's a big money. You lose like a Friday and Saturday night because the trans, you know, because something blew up. It's like, right. oh. No, that compounds. But yeah. I, it also, not a lot of restaurants have the capital to be able to make those improvements. Yeah, and if you do them at the beginning, it's a fraction of what it is right. later. Because you design the electrical it. system where you actually create a separate box and when everything shuts off, it just clicks into these things. And these generators, they don't look that big, and they can run a whole restaurant. Uh, I mean, it's amazingly efficient. And, and they're I, probably hardwired to natural gas. Correct. Yeah, so you just plumb nice. it in there. So while you're doing all this other work, you just plumb that in, and then these systems are remarkable. Power goes off, click, goes on to a new one, and it's powered by natural gas. And these things just turn on once a month automatically and cycle through to make sure that they work. Oh my God! I would say probably twenty to twenty-five grand. It's not cheap, right? But nowadays, a build-out of a restaurant is so expensive, and if your restaurant's doing eight grand a day, let's just say, you know, this is like it, it doesn't take very many days of closure, you know, to like cover that, right? So, but, uh, but, I know we were going to talk about, or I suspect we were going to talk about the new variant. Oh, Macron, Becky, look at her butt. See what I did there? That was like Sir oh, mix yeah, a lot. I get it. Oh, ma, cron. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man, the hits just keep coming. <clears throat> and uh, we are going to see a shadow of the Brooklyn Nets on Wednesday. Oh, we're going. We're going, but who are we going to see? Nobody. Yeah. Kevin Durant, out with COVID. Is Harden Kyrie out? Irving. Irving out. Irving has been a vocal, uh, and, and, and he's probably not va vaccinated, right? I don't know. So um, I'm anxious. It, it sucks, and it seems like I think James Harden is playing. Right. Let's hope. Um, and uh, but yeah, it's a bummer to have tickets. And today I was reading about how so the, the NBA is now allowing teams for every person who's out with COVID protocol, they create a new rule where you can sign another person. Oh wow! So you essentially allowing teams to reinforce, and there are teams with. 
four, five, six, seven players. But they're signing them to 10 days, like right then. Yes. Oh, that's cool. I wonder we'll have some people break out. Right. So it's like all these G League people just bringing up, bringing up, bringing up. And so at least you'll be able to, to, to play. But, you know, if like Saturday, Christmas Day is a huge day for NBA. And all of those stars, Giannis out. out. Yeah. Uh, the Atlanta kid uh, out. Trey Young, yeah. Trey Young. So I wonder if, uh, backed by your numbers, are, are people canceling parties, canceling, canceling large reservations? Are restaurants feeling the stress of this latest uh, wrinkle? Interestingly, um, the all corporate events uh, are canceled. Right. Like anything that's company driven. Uh, we had, uh, I was talking to my partner uh, in our catering company, and she was saying, you know, she runs that, and she was reaching out to different people, and she spoke to, I believe, my, maybe I shouldn't even say it, but a, a very large local company that mm -hmm. always does huge holiday stuff. And the feedback was that we're basically done with any corporate things until other corporations start back up. So now everybody's in this thing where, they don't want to be the first mover. Right. They know it's not like it's a little bit sensitive. So that business is gone. And there are event spaces, um, caterers are as a result, like their miseries are prolonged mm -hmm. for who knows how long. It's, I mean, it's genuinely terrible. In restaurants, we haven't uh, seen a decrease, um, significant decrease. Uh, and we've actually seen. Uh, good movement in private dining right because you know people that want to still do holiday parties they will reach out uh and they still want to do those large group reservations because they have friends family whatever so i haven't seen a big reaction publicly but we haven't seen the variant hit here like it has for instance uh my good friends the danks right back east they were supposed to come out to see us December 27th through January 2nd. So very exciting. Uh, they've never really been able to spend a bunch of time in Portland, and they've been close friends for quite a while. They're bringing their three kids, um, which was really going to be a lot of fun. Um, and uh, Elizabeth, who she went to a company party on Wednesday, a 50-person event. Ten, her sales team was all there. Uh, I think on Friday, no, Saturday, Yes, on Saturday, she tested positive, as did every one of her coworkers at the same event. Everyone? Everyone. That's got to be Omicron-tastic. Unbelievable. So they had, of the 10 people that attended this 50-person event, all 10 of her team pet tested positive. But um, you're not all 50 people. Well, I don't know what this but, statistic, but her, but team, her 10, and they 10, were, it's not like they were all in a little huddle. And they were all vaccinated. All vaccinated. Yeah. And um, so they uh, they all got it. I don't know, but I would assume a large number of the other 40 got it. Right. Statistically, right? Then uh, the next day she had dinner, I believe, with a, a family, and uh, a couple got it then subsequently. Oh, unknowingly, right. Unknowingly, because she didn't know. And so it's like, so the, the it is legitimately uh, catchy. Right. And, uh, but she has very minor symptoms, you know, thankfully vaccinated. Um, and now we're waiting to see if the family and uh, Cliff test positive. And if they do that, of course, jeopardizes the trip. Right. But then today he texted me kind of, these are the thoughts that you have to, you know, this is why I think uh, for tourism and specifically for airplane travel, it's that repercussions are could be serious is that, you know, his concern now is, they're probably all going to be fine to travel on the 27th. Mm -hmm. But then what happens if they travel here and grab it on the way and grab it on the way? Then they're stuck here right. for you know a significant amount of time. So those are the considerations that start coming in as this thing really catches. So right. I think I think tra I think travel, uh, you know, hotels uh, and then any kind of corporate event. Those are going to be the big impacts, the big shots. But we haven't really. And I don't know if we will locally, you know. It I does think. feel like Omicron is kind of, which is this is extremely catchy, but, but by all accounts, less aggressive symptomatically right. version. 
is kind of perfectly dovetailing with a malaise and a an over it yeah. kind of thing that may make for a, a really really unpleasant January. Yeah, I hope not. Um, and we'll see. I mean, so far the state, if the state were to shut, the thing that we can't have in the restaurant industry is occupancy restrictions. Right. When they make it 50%, that makes it a no, uh, it makes it a zero sum game. You cannot without make Without uh, support, right. without federal support, it's, or just money support, it's, it, it's, a, it's a death sentence. Right. So, um, so the hope is that we, you know, I mean, whatever it is, uh, as long as you're, you know, I mean, the mask restriction, I assume, will stay in place for quite a while. But I think people should prepare themselves for just kind of an outburst. Um, and then concurrent with that is if everybody's vaccinated, especially if you have a booster, it's kind of a non-event. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you get it and you're just stuck wherever you are. Yeah, you just tap out for a minute. Yeah, but my, uh, both of my little sisters, and they're in their 20s, mm -hmm. they got it. They're both double vaccinated uh, and I believe boosted. So it's like they got it right. and they're just waiting um, uh, to travel um, back to see my dad for the holidays. So it's like, this thing is just everywhere. Yeah. And it's just gonna be a gigantic pain. My biggest concern is just on the staffing level. Right. Because if you think that you go to one dinner party where everybody's pretty careful uh, and you know your entire team gets it, it's like, I can imagine and I'm anticipating, you know, whole restaurants just catching it, right? And everybody just having to sit at home. Well, I rem that it raged through the commissary yeah. uh, right before I got there, and everyone there was also vaccinated. Yeah, and everybody just sat at home and waited. Yeah, right. I mean, it's kind of a point where uh, now they're saying. I love the uh, the title of the story I was reading about on Friday about how if you catch it after you've been vaccinated, you develop like super, super immunity super immunity <laughs> well and and uh there's um there's a, a certain kind of group of people who are like yeah well everyone's got it nowadays yeah there's like almost a cachet like let's get this over with yeah and that's how i feel and my wife thinks i'm a complete idiot uh but i just feel like god you just want you go you want to go the measles I'm vaccinated route. i'm just just like i just i just want it and then lock me away during a calm period for 10 days right and then just i'm out well, maybe you could get it kind of when you're getting your so shoulder surgery. Oh, good idea. You know? Oh, yeah. And I could I, I bring like a soiled uh, hanky from someone who, oh. who, or from several people who may or Smart. may not have it and put it on you like chloroform oh, yeah. when you're kind of out after oh. the surgery. Gross. And then uh, you could wake. And but don't you think you'd rather do it like doing something really fun? You'd rather have COVID doing something fun? Get COVID. Oh, and then do something Right, like oh. go out and something maybe you wouldn't do normally because you've been being careful. Okay. And make All it right. worth it. I well, don't know what that would Maybe we be. could go roller skating the day before your surgery. <laughs> you want to do that? Yeah, I don't know. Maskless, and we could just get chased around by some guy in like tight pants and old <laughs> roller skates. Like, put your masks on, you guys. Oh, and then we just are like. And we're just not masked, and we're like playing pinball uh, with our skates on. But we don't want to like jeopardize other people. Uh, like some sort of like uh, underground fight club or something. Okay. I still you know? have to see that pig. Uh, just to, were there any Portland chefs in there who did fighting? No, it was and it was all just allegorical, right? It's just it's just a silly. It doesn't actually have to do with food, right? Right. It has to do with regrets and passions and. Oh, aren't and you cerebral? Love. Okay. And, you know, so the food is just the, the pretext, the agent yeah. of the story, and uh, and yeah, I thought it was a wonderful movie. Mm -hmm. I just it, it just kind of. Yeah, I mean, I, I found it quite uh, humorous, and uh, I'm not sure if that was the intent of the filmmakers. Right, <laughs> right. No, I think I think probably for somebody as enmeshed in the industry as you are, that you can't help but see some of those like broadly drawn tropes as corny. Yeah, there was some cornball stuff to it, but it was also, you know, once you can get past like how corny it is, um, then it's pretty. You know, it's a really fun movie, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and of course. Uh, the treatment of Seattle is just delightful. So that that alone, just the total disdain that the characters have for Seattle was just so wonderful. We like that. Oh, and as a food scene person, you just love it. So uh, that that may have been worth the movie, just that. 
<laughs> no, and I think I probably said on another show, but I remember being in Nostrana when he was in there in character, just stomping around and just being weird and bug-eyed and you know clearly deeply into it. Right. And also, like so many of those guys, just teensy. Yeah. Just darn wee teensy. little guy. Yeah. Yeah, and they really portray him in the movie as big. Yeah. And there's a, uh, which I think uh, gives hope to very, very diminutive aspiring actors. Uh-huh. There's There are many roles for you because there are so many Tom Cruises and, uh, and Nicolas Cage's out there that need scenes, and the fight scene is one of them. Oh, um, and so you need you just need to be a little guy who can be an extra. Yeah. So that's more of a mini role than many roles. Uh, yeah, perhaps. Okay. But you think about Sly Stallone. I mean, he's a wee guy. Yep. And so all these guys. So you know, to be, uh, you know, think of Mr. T. He's actually not that tall. I think he's five ten. My height. Okay. And uh, but he you six know, one with the afro. He, yeah, he looks he looks tough as hell. Yeah, and he the does. big boots. Uh, but speaking of Seattle, uh, I was there. Okay. This weekend. Nice segue. Uh, very uh, briefly and. Uh, Let's just say that it is as clean a city downtown as I've seen, cleaner than I can remember of Seattle. Because we opened uh, a, a project there many years ago. I remember that hotel. And uh, so we were right downtown. And, and, it was, and were you embarrassed for Portland in seeing the majesty of Seattle? Well, I just think the comparisons are absurd. Yeah. You know, it's like Seattle, I, I mean, I guess you'd have to go hunting for it, but you don't have to go hunting in Portland. Right. I mean, it was, I saw one storefront that was shut down. One. Right. And we walked blocks and blocks and blocks. Yeah, see, the the opposite side of that coin, excuse me, <coughs> for me is, is seeing these buildings that have been closed for so long where the plywood's finally removed. Right. And then you see into it, and there's there's almost like, you almost feel uncomfortable, like you're seeing a secret. Like close it, cover it back up. <laughs> I think our our feeling is so very opposite theirs, and I don't know what is it. Why are we so ham handed about managing that? I don't know. I mean, they've made a real effort. Literally, no like walk from probably you know probably eight city blocks, and they're bigger city blocks in Seattle than we have, uh, back around and so forth. So probably a, a mile of walking. Mm-hmm. And nothing. I mean, not garbage on the street, not a single tent anywhere, not a uh, boarded up storefront except for one place that, and it was painted and looked nice, so it yeah. just kind of blended in. Uh, but, you know, so the, the comparison, I can't speak beyond comparing the two. Right. And so when people say Portland, Seattle, uh, no, 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 no. But Seattle is, is, is pristine uh, in relation to Portland. Yeah. Uh, and... But of course, their downtown is the center of major, major industry. Yeah. You know, when you think about Amazon owning four or five, you know, blocks of real estate. So, you know, if they, if, if we had massive companies with that much influence, uh, that might make a difference. You know, if Nike's campus was in downtown, downtown Portland, right. I think that there would be some pressure to uh, keep things cleaned up. Doesn't mean that the problems are solved, but it means that it's clean. Are you? Would you? Uh just from a from your perspective would you say that seattle is doing a better job or just sweeping it under the rug great question i don't know yeah um it would appear they're doing both mm-hmm. uh, but you know i i mean i if i took the time to drive around and try to find where if they're sweeping it under the rug that would suggest that it's been swept somewhere somewhere there's a concentration right and imagine if you swept up portland you'd need an entire neighborhood yeah to put the swept up stuff. I mean, yeah. it would be it's no small, like moving a village. Right. You know, a small, you know, 10,000 person village. And uh, so if it's like that in Seattle, they they hide it well because you didn't see anything. And we drove in. You yeah. drive in Portland and it's everywhere on the, the side of the streets and the overpass, you know, wherever. Right. So it was, uh, but you know, it's a, Seattle's a fun town for little kids. My daughter was, just enraptured with the flying, the guys throwing the fish right. uh, at the market. Always and you fun. kind of forget as you grow up developing a distaste for our uh, our neighbor, the Emerald City, uh, for other reasons. You kind of forget what a what a great town oh, it it's is. Oh, so, it is. It's gorgeous. I love to go up there. And I think uh, you're almost compelled as a native Portlander 
to carry that torch of being the redheaded stepchild. Yeah. Of, you know, and from the beginning, they always got, they were always the crown of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, yes, they have uh, monstrous companies up there, Microsoft, Amazon, Boeing, Boeing yeah. that have pushed that uh, city just to a different place. Yeah. And one of the things we both lament is, is how um, cost conscious yeah. our, our city is. I mean, we, you know, at the same time, we're both, you know, as cheap. cheap as it gets. We are cheap. And um, so it's, it's, a, it's a tricky uh, hypocrisy for us to yeah. complain about Portlanders being cheap while we are ourselves. Um, I went to Tom Douglas uh, Bakery. Tom Douglas, one of the great guys right. uh, in, in American terms of food, I think. Just a really neat guy. Just so committed to his city and to kind of, uh, you know, his approach to kind of the culinary tradition and specifically the Pacific Northwest, you know, and all of its bounty, just a neat, neat guy. Right. Um, but went to his bakery, Dahlia Bakery, which they've now merged with Serious Pie, his pizza concept. And uh, they do not mess around with their prices. They're up there. They're not oh, afraid. Boy. Oh, yeah. So I got, I believe I got a mochi donut for my daughter. I got a bacon and egg sandwich. Um. I'd like to say, oh, and a, a, a salad for my wife. She Talk wants, about the salad so I can give you a price of what you paid. A kale uh, salad with uh, like a lemon juice and uh, fresh Parmesan. Ooh. So just real simple. Sure. Just what she likes. That so, was $22. It was $38. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. So a no a messing around. So good for him, though. Yeah, well, if people will pay it, uh, and that was that's one of the things that we kind of go back and forth on is that there is a true cost to this business, and hopefully we can get folks on board. But we both, uh, not to pick on our mothers, but we both have this situation where I think both our mothers will say things like, "Support restaurant workers, do this, do that," and then they'll see uh, a menu where you know something a, a steak is sixty dollars, and like, absolutely not. Yes. Living our values is hard. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's true, right? No, it is true. I mean, Portlanders always, uh, you know, vote for affordable housing initiatives, but no neighborhood welcomes affordable housing. Right. Right. So. Oh, that's a great idea. Just not here. Just not here. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly. Um, and so it's just, but you go anywhere. I mean, Multnomah Village, very progressive area, mm -hmm. but they're up in arms anytime there's any kind of development going on. Sure. You know, and it's just like, yeah. I mean, of course. Yeah. No. Yeah. You don't. You can do it. Just not in my yard. Is a is a hard, is a hard policy. But it is our our policy. It is. Uh, bring me something full of holiday joy. What have you got for me that's gonna just put a smile on my face? <laughs> That has to do with sleigh bells and or reindeer or um, a nifty present you're excited about. Huh. I hope the Danks come. I'd really like to see Cliff. God, it would be great if they if they would come. Um, and, uh, oh boy, you're putting me on the spot here. Okay, no, that's all right. That. Um, we're, you're going to do a ham too, I assume, and scalloped potatoes. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, i got to figure it out. I mean, you know, those Hawaiian rolls are always so yummy mm. and... Um, you know, people just like them, and the, and then that with the ham in your house kind of makes for a never-ending snack. Well, yeah, I feel like Hawaiian rolls are a day two sort of affair. <sighs> They're just so dangerous, and they last for a long time. Yeah, they and do. They heat up and toast up so mm, well. Preservatives. Oh yes. <laughs> I had a Popeyes chicken sandwich yesterday. Don't tell anybody, but it was good. Yeah, it was really good, and the bun was fantastic. Huh. Uh, as I you might imagine, use. it's not it's not like it, it's got a similar mouthfeel to the Hawaiian. It's a tiny bit yellow, but it's not super sweet. But it has that sort of like glaze, like cr cr cracky, a little bit outside, soft, held together. The chicken was identifiable. It was a really good sandwich. Yeah. First I, time I've ever had that. I feel like if you could come up with the perfect bun for me, it would be kind of a potatoy bun thing that most of it's probably that is probably the dough base is some sort of starch enriched, you know, thing that makes extra soft. Right. But then if we could get get a Dutch crunch on top of that. Wait a minute. What does that mean? The Dutch crunch is like that 
crackly crickly stuff on top of a uh, bun um, well the way the way you do it is you the dough before putting it in the oven you actually paint some uh, kind of water and flour mixed together so you put a paste on top of it I see and then as it as it uh, cooks and rises it hardens and then it becomes all crackly and crunchy on the top oh. so Dutch crunches have um and they have that at a lot of, um, uh, I believe, at even kind of national chains, uh, like Subway. I think has the the, the crunchy top uh, bread alternative. Oh, really? It's I'll delightful. Have to keep my eyes out for that Dutch yeah. crunch. And of course, if you're clever, you can put a little bit of like salt or something in sure. it, so it's actually like crunch them ups on top of your bun. I'd like to see that. And then when you toast it, it brings it back to its crunchiness, right? Oh, so it's a little bit like kind of oatmeal-y when it's room temp. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. It's not it's not exciting when it's cold. Would that be interesting for a hot dog? Oh yeah, for sure. Really? Yeah. Justin, note to self: Dutch Crunch, because we're we're gonna do a hot dog cart in the new year. Yeah, a little bit harder. No hot dog. That'd work. You know, I'm kind of wondering: could you roll it in the paste and then do it? No, because you really only want it on the top. On the top. Because it needs that dry amounts, and then as and then as the bread expands. It crackles. I see. Right. So. It might not be good for a hot dog because you might need to keep those buns warm in a way that'll yeah that would more keep of a steam being, warm. Yeah. But when you can kind of put something through the toaster, and that's why it works well on those conveyor toasters mm -hmm. that the national chains use, mm -hmm. is that it really does crack them up. Inner toast. Oh, we got to get back there someday. Oh man, that's a whole episode. You think? Itself, yeah. All right. Well, we'll tease it for the new year. Oh. Um. Really, Merry Christmas. Um, I'm excited about the game on Wednesday. Go Blazers. Go Blazers. I'm excited. You know, you and I, we can double mask, I guess. I guess. I might wear one of those visors, the, the, although that doesn't really help, does it? I don't know. Uh-uh, probably not. And then we should just bring a straw. And share a, a fountain drink? I don't No, You'll have a fountain drink, and I'll have like a... A whiskey. A beer. With a straw? I've never don't tried that. Don't drink it with a straw. Is it possible? Uh, people will catch you on the big screen. I bet. <laughs> Is that guy drinking a beer with a straw? Oh, man. Anything to get on the big screen. Well, maybe we, we get that. Do you have that hat still with the cups and the straws that go to your mouth? The two? Still? I don't think I ever had one. Really? Yeah. Maybe I'm confusing that with the Dairy Queen Sunday cups. Yeah. Those well, are a lot smaller. I would love I would love a hat like that. Those, okay. are, like, those are hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas future. I'm, yeah. I'm writing that down on my uh, what to get Curdy. Especially if they had cozies in them where the beer actually stayed cold. Yeah, that makes sense. But again, it's a straw, so how does that not? How does that work? Uh, I guess a straw, if you drink it and the, the drink is above you, makes it okay. Huh. Yeah. I don't know why. It's a gravity thing. Yeah, and you can't move. No quick movements. Mm -mm. No head fakes. Well, maybe we just have like a little styrofoam container so it keeps it from splashing around too. Smart. I like that. Some sort of uh, cooling elements yes. attached to a battery. <laughs> well, we could get one of those natural gas generators you were talking about. They're not big, right? Uh, no, they're not. Not, but not. Would they be too big for a hat? Hmm. I guess we, I'd have to look into what nanotechnology exists. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Honey, I shrunk the insulated hat for uh, beer. But you could just get a battery-powered one. Okay. Those are also big now with uh, homes. It's the battery generator. Yeah. Speaking of big, I just saw a picture of Elon Musk. Yeah? Dude, it's lumpy. Oh. Like, he's got this crazy dicky do and not much else. Like, skinny arms, skinny legs, and just this metal thing that is kind of, it's Off like pudding. skinny Santa. Huh. Uh-huh. And that's what you do with billions? I Maybe he's just got a big stack of cash in there that he rains it out of, but it was something weird. It was terrible. He was wearing an ill-fitting suit, and he just looked lumpy, and he's got that funny, like, crazy Britney Spears haircut right now. But he's the man of the year. Unlike Jeff Bezos, that guy's like a jacked-up rock. Yeah. Holy mackerel. I think he's got Kevin Hart's trainer. Oh. Yeah, so he does like a 1,000 push-ups a day. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, anything you want to lead? You want to tell us about anything you want to drop, anything exciting, anything you want to leave that's, you know, it's hard to live. It's hard to live your beliefs. I thought that was really strong. <laughs> well, it's just true, right? That uh, is. We don't do a good job of that as the city. No, I don't think we do a good job of that as a people. But, I, you know, we can have a talk about America's puritanical nature and the, uh, the contrast with our behavior yep. on another show.
Yeah, that sounds great. Ho, ho, ho. Hold on till next year, listeners. <laughs> because uh, this is Leather Stores uh, with Kurt Hoffman, as always, uh, on the hotline saying... See you in 2022. Merry holidays to all of you. Or are we going to record before 2022? I hope so. Yeah. Uh, all right. So just, uh, happy, ho- ha- happy Happy holidays. We're going to have a look back episode. Great end of Hanukkah and uh, Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. Kwanzaa's coming around here. But I don't, Soon? I don't, yeah. I haven't checked the calendar. Uh, so all the denominations, we wish you a merry, happy holidays. Yeah. That's a good way to finish. Okay. We'll do that. All right. Out.